Thank you for inviting me here. It's uh, it's great to be in Lisbon. It made me like escape the horrible Brussels weather like yesterday, um, where there were 10 degrees and a huge storm. And then I arrived here in Lisbon, and it was like perfect, uh, perfect day. So thanks for for inviting me. And uh, first of all, my name is Elisa Lironi, and I work for the European Citizen Action Service. It's an NGO based in Brussels, and we have been for the past 28 years. Um, empowering citizens to exercise their rights in the EU. So it's really, a, uh, I work in the NGO um, sector. Um, and today, actually, I was going to, I'm going to be talking about, let's say, what the rector was, uh, was mentioning. Let's say the, the brighter sides of technology instead of the darker ones. For the darker ones, I'll just leave it to Tyson after me. And um, so the, the title of this uh, short presentation, uh, just to give you a bit of what I do, is called Harnessing Digital Tools to Revitalize European Democracy, which is the title of uh, an article I wrote for the think tank Carnegie a few months ago. So first things first, what is ICAS? And as I said, what do we do? Like we empower citizens to um, exercise their rights in the European Union. We have a few services with the commission in which we answer to European citizens legal um, inquiries about their rights in the EU. And we provide them with an expertise, a legal uh, expertise in 72 hours. Just so you know that uh, this service is, is available free of charge for citizens and we help citizens when they have especially obstacles in free movement in, in the European Union. And um, so we have our EU rights focus area in which we deal with uh, European um, rights issues. And the second focus area that we have is uh, European democracy, which is the focus area that I am managing. So what do we do? We do three things at ECAS. We implement projects all around Europe with partners from, from different organizations all across Europe. We uh, do service provision. So apart from this Your Europe Advice Service that we have in which we answer to legal inquiries of citizens, we also have a service with the European Commission called the European Citizens Initiative Forum. Um, and I will talk about that later. And uh, we also do a lot of uh, research. Our, our European <laughs> democracy focus area actually started off with one pillar, which is the digital democracy one. And since this year, we have added two other pillars to this, uh, to this focus area, which are online disinformation and countering populism. Why did we do that? Because when we started five years ago, what we wanted to do was to assess how technology can actually improve and foster democratic processes. And so we started off with the digital de uh, democracy. But then we realized that you know, other things are complement to what is happening to our democratic societies. So basically how people access to information then gives them a huge influence on how they actually take decisions in, in a society. So, and the whole problem of online disinformation, misinformation, and fake news. Um, and we also realized that there was a huge also link to what is happening with the rise of populist movements and let's say more alternative forms to traditional uh, party politics. But today in this presentation I will only focus on digital democracy. So first things first, what is digital democracy? So that we have the same notion of what it means. Digital democracy just refers to the use of information and communication technology, so ICT, in order to support democratic processes and to make, uh, um, to foster um, you know, democratic institutions so that they can work better. It relates to two actors, the governments on the one hand and the citizens. And the governments can be the public administration, the representative, the political party, so politicians, and uh, of course, us as, as citizens. There are three aspects of e-democracy. As I said, that there are two actors, the government on the one hand, and the citizens. And most probably you have heard a lot about e-government. E-government is one aspect of e digital democracy. And usually e-government focuses on the <coughs> government itself because it is the way to use technology to enhance like service provision. So public administration ser services and what the, the government sometimes do is open consultations to, to try to get citizens input. 
The second aspect, I would categorize it as e-transparency. That means it's how the government is trying to make transparent its work um, in order for citizens to actually understand and have access to documents so that they can have an informed political um, you know, opinion and then influence policy making. The third one is the one I focus on, which is e-participation. So it talks about all of those tools which allow citizens to actually have concrete impact or to collaborate with governments in order to improve policies or to, to work on policy making uh, together. There are so many uh, different e-participation mechanisms happening at the moment in Europe that maybe you might have heard of or you haven't heard of. These are just some of them. As you can see, um, uh, there are many examples that I have assessed in my research uh, around participatory budgeting, uh, e-consultations, uh, e-citizens initiatives, e-petitions, e-voting, and uh, crowdsourcing. And there are many more. And these are already experiments happening at the local level, especially, also at national level, and a bit less at the European level. But for example, there are many local mayors who are nowadays trying to uh, work together with their citizens in order to decide on how a neighborhood should be. Or for example, uh, Mayor Hidalgo in Paris actually started a huge experimentation around participatory budgeting, which uh, really uh, the, became a success. And so she also implemented more e-consultations and e-citizens initiatives. Um, so, as you can see, many of these aspects can be included in e-participation. So, before, uh, the rector I heard was also mentioning about direct democracy and how, you know, many populist movements nowadays are using it kind of as a way to, uh, to say that our representative democracies are not enough and what they're calling for is direct democracy, power to the people, and that's, um, that's the way forward. So in our case, as ECAS, and many scholars and academics also agree on this, digital democracy is not meant to replace traditional forms of representative democracies, but rather to complement them by adding elements of citizens' empowerment and more direct participation. This means that um, digital democracy is just a complementary channel. Um, and our representative democracies are made you know, mainly through electoral systems, and uh, this is not something that would break it down, but only um, based on the fact that people are uh, not satisfied with how um, electoral systems are, are done, and the fact that they can vote for their candidates only every five years is just simply not enough anymore. So why foster e-participation? Why is it that many, um, let's say, local level politicians and national level politicians are experimenting more with technology nowadays to understand how to increase democratic processes? One of the reasons is because we have also a generational change. We have an increase of uh, technological advances with di which didn't exist in the past generations. So once upon a time, for example, my father would be part of a political party. Uh, we would be a member of a political party. He would be a part of a trade union. And there was a lot of intermediaries who could help citizens to voice their concerns to politicians, civil society organizations, trade unions, etc. Now, what has changed with technology? It's very simple. Nowadays, technology has the potential to make uh, um, your opinions more widespread and more direct to decision makers. That means that through a cell phone, you can actually reach out directly to your, your politicians and just say directly what you want without even going through uh, an NGO such as ECAS. And there are also, um, there's also a huge, uh, a few researches showing how people, um, young people especially, are disengaged with politics, how it is done. And what I mean with how it is done is that every five years you go to elections and then that's it. And then your representatives just decide whatever they want for the next five years. And if you're not happy, you basically vote for a new candidate or, or you, change your, you change your preference. But there are a few things why young people, for example, are disengaged in politics. First of all, there's a, there are socioeconomic factors. So um, while our parents might have probably seen a huge economic boom, um, this is the generation where young people are very much like uh, unemployed and they see a very, very negative vision of uh, uh, the economics of our future. 
They also have, uh, no, they see no use, for example, in participating in the system which they consider to be obsolete. And they focus a lot also, while they're quite negative on the sense of the society and how politics is done, they do have quite a lot of optimism on individualism and on self-development because nowadays people have more access, for example, to have a university degree. So young people are also very much focused on, uh, on developing themselves uh, sometimes instead of looking uh, at the bigger picture and creating communities. And they also have different ways of manifesting what they're interested in. Look at what is happening with Greta with the climate uh, protests. These are also um, ways in which uh, young people are very active and it doesn't mean that they don't want to pro participate in politics. They just find other ways to, to express their opinion. And of course, they are exploiting technology. Um, so the, the interesting thing is that populism and populists and maybe more extreme parties are great at exploiting this technology while more conservative parties and more traditional parties have yet to actually exploit these technologies in order to, to make them efficient for their, you know, for, for their purposes. So these are things that politicians uh, should be thinking about. Um, and ICT, information and communication technology, it is also important that it is a two-way process. So citizens are also seeing that they're using it sometimes but then politicians maybe have their own assistants answering back to the Twitter accounts or to the Facebook accounts. And this kind of gives a, a sense that they're a bit fake. At least, you know, people say Trump has his own account and he uses his account personally. He might say a lot of strange things, but at least he's kind of genuine on, on that sense. So what is the potential of e-participation? There are a lot of researchers here, and I won't go into detail. If you're interested in knowing more, you can come up to me or just ask me afterwards about a few cases in Iceland with their constitutional reform, in Finland with the new uh, Citizens Initiative Act, etc., and in many, many places, Latvia, um, Greece, France, etc. What is the potential? So research has shown that technology and these mechanisms of crowdsourcing and working together with citizens can actually enhance participation beyond, let's say, the usual suspects. So trying to reach out to, to young people. Um, it can ensure a learning process because what happens when you participate in, in co-creation with your politicians? You start learning also a bit more. It's a, a sort of civic education mechanism because you need to get involved and you need to try to understand in order to, to work together with your politicians. Then it engages, as I said, young people because it's using their means and their ways of, of communicating nowadays. Um, there have been uh, examples of innovative ideas coming from citizens, although citizens may not be experts, but for example, crowdsourcing ideas from citizens um, can get you back a bit to reality. And citizens can tell you what their daily problems are and what they would like to see more in, for example, their own neighborhood or their own national level, etc. And uh, so it has shown that some cases have increased political trust and legitimacy. Although the problem is that, um, as in representative democracies, it is always up to the political willingness of politicians to actually decide to implement the citizens' contribution. And this has brought a bit of frustration because it's quite annoying for a citizens to uh, you know, use their time and effort to participate in uh, crowdsourcing or participatory democracy and see that in the end it's the politician who decides to, to take the final uh, decision. I study the EU level especially, and uh, raise your hand who knows what the European Citizens Initiative is. Okay, now this is very, very, this is not encouraging at all. <laughs> but I'm happy to be here then, I, I found a purpose, okay. Um, all right, so the European Citizens Initiative was introduced by the Lisbon Treaty. And it is basically the only formal way for citizens to actually voice to the European Commission a legislative proposal that they would like to see. And it can be on anything, provided that it is you know, in the competences of the European Union. 
And I really suggest you to, to Google this mechanism because it's really the only way for citizens to, to voice a policy that they want to put at the European Union level. How does it work? If you're a citizen and you're, for example, there's one at the moment called uh, End the Cage, um, which is basically asking to, to stop having cages for animals in, uh, in farms and things, uh, which has a huge amount of, uh, of signature. So it works like a petition. So if you're a citizen and you want to start some, an issue um, that you care about at the EU level, you have to ask six other people from different, residing in different EU member states to form a committee. And together you can propose uh, a, you know, um, um, a citizen's initiative to the commission. If the commission registers it, you have one year to gather one million signatures in the seven different member states and even beyond. But you need to gather one million signatures depending on the quota system on the population of the member states. And um, this was created actually, um, the regulation, the first regulation entered in 2012. And actually, um, there was a lot of frustration on how it was working, so we worked also with Vice President Timmermans in order to push for a new uh, revision of the regulation, which will enter into force uh, in 2020. There have been around five of them, which managed to get one million signatures. For example, Right to Water, which was against the privatization of water in Europe. Um, uh, there was which we kind of called the anti-abortion one, which got kind of the, uh, um, the, um, the, the church to help them. Um, and it also got one million signatures. Um, so check it out. We also have the ECI forum in which there are a lot of guidance notes, uh, et cetera. And Can I ask you a question? Yeah, about sure. Because I have questions here already. On my oh, cool. Okay. And it is related to You just gave an example of something that I know it's very important. It's a tool we have to develop yeah. uh, policies at European level. You know, level. In, in Portuguese, how do you think? Uh, Iniciativa Quiet Cidadãos. I am not sure the, okay. the translation. But the question is who, we, who should be responsible for educating citizens uh, regarding the existence of these tools and uh, how to use these digital means? To, yeah. to, to use democracy using these digital means. Currently, the Commission is spending quite amount of money to, uh, to there's an ECI campaign going on uh, all around Europe with events, but as you can see, it's not enough because <laughs> most probably it didn't reach uh, Portugal, but I will put pressure on them to do that. And, um, and yeah, civil society actors have been fighting really, really a lot because this kind of mechanism actually entered into force thanks to a lot of civil society uh, actors who were calling for like citizens assemblies as a mechanism and then like European Citizens Initiative and it managed to get in in the Lisbon Treaty and then in 2012 we had the regulation and then now we're in 2019 and we've learned so many lessons about how it can work. And okay, it has brought a lot of <coughs> frustration because one million signatures is not easy to get. In fact, around 70 or, 70 or 80 ECIs have been uh, registered and only five of them managed to get one million signatures and none of them actually became a legislative proposal by the commission. Now, you have to be careful because there's a lot of frustration about this, right? If you gather one million signatures, why isn't the commission already giving a legislation uh, about it? Okay, so one million signatures is never representative of 500 million people in the European Union. So as I said before, digital democracy is always a complementary tool to representative democracy, and we have to always be careful about calling for you know, direct democracy because um, it's it, it wouldn't work, and it, I, I wouldn't want it to work that way either. So the second thing, and then you can ask me questions about it, uh, is the online EU public consultation. So this is more technical. This is when the Commission is starting a legislative ITER, and they're asking citizens and stakeholders to give them a contribution on the online um, consultation. Who has heard of the European Commission's online consultation process? Okay, so la like last year there was this whole uh, issue around the summertime to change an hour. That was a consult. Did you hear about that? Okay, that was a consultation launched by the Commission, just so you know. That was the formal instrument. 
And you know, well, most of them were German responses, but then we have to also talk about how representative these tools are. But in any case, that was something that the commission said, I want to hear the citizens and stakeholders tell me what you think, and then we'll try to implement this. The third one is the petitions to the European Parliament, but it's maybe a bit more specific because you can only petition on something which is existing. In any case, then there have been other ones. As you can see, some DGs have worked on their own, but those are not formal. What we have assessed is that these e-participation tools are limited in quantity and also in efficiency. And, um, and yeah. So just to conclude on the recommendations. So after all of the research that I've done in the past few years, um, what do I think should be done on e-participation and can it foster democracy? My answer is yes. Digital tools need to be nowadays much more part in the discussion on how to reform our representative democracies which are completely obsolete. People are not okay anymore with just um, you know, voting every five years for their politicians and then not having a say. Because now with technology, you can do it. So there are three recommendations which came out of my research. Um, so first of all, digital democracy experiments have to made, be made more and more um, wide known and widespread. Because uh, um, there are many things that we still need to learn that research doesn't have enough data on and research cannot prove completely that it has, you know, it can potential democratic processes. But there is a good chance that it can. So we need to foster more grassroots and national initiatives for digital democracy. Should the, and the EU, of course, should already like work on its own tools and make them uh, more efficient. Um, and the third one, which is most important, there's a lot of negative connotation around technology nowadays. If you look at what Commissioner Vestager did in the past few years, she made great battles against you know, big uh, companies such as uh, uh, well, Facebook, Amazon, and everything, which is fine. I'm not saying that it's not okay. I think it's perfectly normal and it, it is necessary that we frame these you know, big technology influencers in the world. The problem is that I think that the, the, um, the tech companies nowadays need to be part more of the discussion about how policy making is having their influence and is you know, changing our democratic society. And if you've seen, Facebook has also appointed Nick Clegg, Nick Clegg as one of their chief operations person in uh, Silicon Valley. It means that also tech companies are realizing that they need to talk more with policymakers on how to create a framework uh, also for the virtual world and so that it brings only the potential and not all of the challenges. Thanks a lot.